is an antidepressant comparison. So this is um, kind of a companion to the antipsychotic comparison that we did um, about maybe six weeks ago or so. Um, objectives for today are to identify the indications for the antidepressant medications. Um, we're also going to look at uses, so beyond the formal indications, we're going to compare the pharmacologic targets um, and evaluate the adverse effects. But before we get started, I felt compelled to include a formal disclosure. Um, a couple things. So one, some of this is going to be off-label. Um, two, there are some things that I've just compiled into the class of medications um, purely for the sake of time. Um, I could have taken any individual class and done a whole didactic on it. Um, so there, there are some generalizations that are in there, and this is by no means all-inclusive. Um, so there are going to be interactions and adverse effects and things like that that aren't necessarily covered, but I tried to um, incorporate some of the most pertinent. Because I'm finding is I'm super excited about these topics and I get into them that were um, way too in-depth. So I, my guess is one of the things that you see that's missing there is the efficacy information. Um, so try as I might, um, I don't know if you can see, but I have 18 slides anyways, and that doesn't include any of the efficacy information. Um, so I'm going to propose that we include that in the future didactic topic, because there was no way to do a general comparison and um, really do justice to the amount of efficacy information that we have. So because we're going to do a general comparison, um, I wanted to include a couple reference slides. Um, so we are looking at the class of antidepressants as a whole. Um, so for the medications that are on this slide, I am going to refer to them by the class. Um, so our SSRIs, our SNRIs, our TCAs, our MAOIs. Um, I included the medications that I'm assuming are underneath that class. I recognize some of them like the levomilnasopran, sometimes is included as an SNRI, sometimes it's included as one of the newer agents or a miscellaneous, um, but its mechanism, mechanism of action is pretty consistent, so that's why I did include it there. And then here are the other um, agents that we will be talking about. I have abbreviated them in a couple of the um, slides, so here are just the abbreviations. For the nifazidone and trazodone, they work relatively similarly, so that was why I grouped them together. For our brexanolone and the esketamine, um, we had a whole didactic on the esketamine, um, but for the life of me, I could not, um, in my type A tendencies, leave them out because they technically are antidepressants. But we're going to cover them just very generally looking at pharmacologic targets, um, specifically because they have very isolated treatment. Um, so brexanolone is the approved treatment for um, patients with postpartum depression and esketamine is for those with refractory depression. So there are quite a few meta-analyses and systematic reviews that are available. And one of the things that they first start with um, as they look at the different antidepressant products are how they work. Um, and as we're getting into a better understanding of and I'm going to focus on major depression, uh, major depressive disorder, it's becoming more and more apparent that we haven't been as effective at treating um, depression as we really would like to be. Um, so about a third of patients will respond to their first antidepressant. Um, if we have to use multiple versions, generally we can get about two thirds of the patients um, to really have significant symptom improvement. But for that last third, that's a significant number of patients. We are looking at potentially having to match up different antidepressants. Um, so if something didn't work or we need to match things up, the pharmacologic targets become really important. Our original understanding of depression um, really was focused on the monoamine hypothesis. So the thought that there are um, three of our neurotransmitters, so the serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine, that really play a significant role um, in the pathophysiology of depression. For that reason, um, they really have been the focus of treatments, as you can see. 
So of our antidepressants, serotonin tends to be the main action that most of these agents have. Um, so our four big classes, SSRIs, SNRIs, TCAs, and MAOIs, all of them have serotonergic actions, and quite a few of our other agents. So mirtazapine, the nefazidone, trazodone, velazodone, and bordeoxetine. As we move from there, so not every patient is going to respond to serotonergic agents, and some of the patients really can't tolerate them well at all. So what are our other options? Um, we have a handful of norepinephrine agents, so agents that are going to improve um, the concentrations of norepinephrine. Um, so bupropion tends to be the new one that pops up in that bucket. We have a couple that really focus on dopamine, but I'm going to give this as a um, kind of a teaser. Some of the agents that work on serotonin may inadvertently or indirectly increase the dopamine. So maybe they don't have direct actions, um, but they might be able to do so. So our two main agents in the dopamine focused or dopamine direct bucket would be MAOIs and bupropion. Our newer agents, and this was really the reason that I felt compelled to include them, so for patients that haven't responded well or don't traditionally respond well to those other medications that we had, we're looking at new mechanisms of action. So S-ketamine for um, patients who had refractory treatment, refractory depression, so that's going to antagonize some of the glutamate receptors, um, so block the NMDA receptors of the glutamate pathway to potentially help if there's an excited toxicity compound, which seems to be incredibly effective for patients, especially those with suicidal thoughts. The other agent, um, the brexanolone, really is starting to look at a totally different pathway. Um, so in patients with postpartum depression, just very generally, um, we recognize a lot of stress um, within that particular time frame and the um, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, so kind of our stress axis. Um, we've known that that plays a role in depression, but this was really the first time where we saw if we're able to tone down that particular pathway, we could see improvement in depression. Um, so brexanolone actually acts as a modulator to increase the overall um, tone of GABA, our main inhibitory neurotransmitter, to settle down that um, inflammatory axis, the HPA axis, and that's been shown to be relatively beneficial for those patients. Small subset, um, so a very specific population, but kind of intriguing to see that we're starting to move in different directions. For the remainder of the talk, we're really going to focus on those other traditional pathways. So just in general as, as a refresher, um, we found that we could inhibit the reuptake um, of our neurotransmitters, so serotonin, dopamine, and um, norepinephrine. So if we prevent the pump, um, which would be the little purple um, circle that's sitting, um, so this is a neuronal synapse, um, so presynaptic would be the nerve that's coming in to pass a message to the postsynaptic receptor. So it passes the message through those chemicals. So we realized that the transport porter protein that grabs those neurotransmitters and pulls them back in presynaptically, if we inhibit that, we have more serotonin, more epinephrine, more dopamine in those pathways, we could see some improvement. So that's really our biggest bucket. We found that that works and we developed a large number of medications that do that. So by doing that, they're increasing the amount of neurotransmitters that are available and hopefully reestablishing what, um, what messages come forward from those systems, which are incredibly diverse. That doesn't work for everyone. So as we said, only two thirds of patients, we can really get good response from our antidepressants. Um, so we've had to start to look at what else can we do other than just keeping more neurotransmitter available. So some of the other actions um, that we've developed with our antidepressants are actually working on the receptors, so things that fall on that postsynaptic side, so the proteins that receive the message from the neurotransmitters. And we have a number of interesting um, developments that have happened in this particular area. So for mirtazapine, so mirtazapine works on both the norepinephrine and serotonin receptors. So on the norepinephrine side, it's going to block some of its receptors, um, which seems like, well, maybe that's not a good thing. 
but receptors don't always just sit on the postsynaptic side. They also can be on the presynaptic neuron and essentially be breaks to say, hey, there's enough neurotransmitter here, stop releasing it. So what mirtazapine is going to do is it's going to block those receptors that serve as breaks. So we can see increased concentrations being released of things like serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. So a little bit different than what we saw with the um, reuptake inhibition. Some of our other agents, um, so mirtazapine also works on some of the other serotonin receptors, um, but some of our other agents work on those as well. Um, so the nifazidone and trazodone, as well as mirtazapine, also work by blocking some of the serotonin receptors. Now, if we're increasing serotonin, it seems counterintuitive that by blocking serotonin receptors, we'd see improvement. But what they found is by blocking some of those receptors, we can actually get an increase in release in other agents, norepinephrine, dopamine, um, potentially glutamate in some places. Also by blocking some of the serotonin receptors, the 2C receptors, um, 2C receptors are in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So for some of the patients that are having trouble with, um, especially with sleep cycle, it can help resynchronize their circadian rhythm. Um, and that may help get other things back on track to improve their overall symptoms. We also can see, um, so velazidone and vortioxetine. So these agents um, actually took advantage of the improvement that we saw in some patients that were on SSRIs that were also given buspirone. So these both act as partial agonists for the serotonin 1A receptor. Um, so they, they're not as robust a signaler as serotonin is, um, so it is toned down a little bit. But by having some of this activity on the serotonin 1A receptors, we actually can see an increase in the release of serotonin. Um, and we sometimes see in different parts of the brain an increased release of dopamine and norepinephrine, um, mainly dopamine, but norepinephrine in a couple specific pathways. So even though we have mainly serotonergic agents, they may not be working only on serotonin. Um, their after effects may very well trickle into some of those other neurotransmitters. The last class um, are our MAOI inhibitors. So these tend to be reserved um, specifically last line just because of the concern related to drug interactions and food interactions. So what these agents do is they actually target the monoamine oxidase enzyme that breaks down dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. So by preventing the body from breaking that down, we have much greater concentrations of those neurotransmitters, which may be a good thing, but could also potentially put some patients at risk for things like serotonin syndrome um, or even systematic processes such as a hypertensive crisis um, because there's a lot more of those neurotransmitters and there really isn't a good way for the body to, to break those down. So those have been reserved, they're effective, um, but a little bit um, later down the line if patients have failed other things because of their potential toxicity and the safety risk. So what does this mean? This means we've got a bunch of different agents um, that do work for our patients. So where could we put, where could we and do we use them? So I broke this into two charts because the first one was, um, <laughs> the font size got really small. So the first one are the FDA approved indications. Um, and I did take liberty, that was why that disclosure came in from the beginning. Not all of the SSRIs are approved for all of the anxiety disorders, um, but quite a few do carry formal FDA approval for some of the anxiety disorders. So as you can see with each of these, we definitely see improvement in depression. We also can see improvement in anxiety, but the stretch and the reach of our antidepressants has really diversified over time. Um, so we now see antidepressants routinely being used for different types of pain. Um, we can see them being used in endocrine disorders, so premenstrual dysphoric disorder, the vasomotor symptoms of menopause. Um, we also can see things like um, um, so we see these agents being used for a lot more than just the depression. Now these are the formal indications. The other uses diversify even beyond that. Um, so including anxiety disorders, we also see um, 
agitated and aggressive behavior in patients with developmental disabilities, with autism, with dementia. Um, we can see some of them being useful in kids with, um, or adults with ADHD, eating disorders. They're used adjunctively for treatment of other medical conditions. So sometimes gastrointestinal disorders, um, genitourinary disorders, those tend to be more commonly things like um, nocturnal enuresis, so bedwetting um, overnight, or individuals that have stress incontinence. Um, we've also seen some improvements. Maybe not using the antidepressant effects of some of these medicines, but some of the other actions that they have. So my take home from these two really is that um, antidepressants have been in the top utilized medications in the country for um, for decades now. And this is one of the reasons. Beyond the prevalence of depression and anxiety, they're starting to be used in so many other conditions, um, both medical as well as mental health type conditions. Um, so if we have patients that have other comorbid disease states, maybe we're taking a step back to look at, okay, would it be helpful um, to potentially try something like a tricyclic antidepressant that I wouldn't normally think of um, as being first or second line for this patient because they also have you know, chronic migraines and neuropathic pain, maybe we can utilize one medication to help with a number of the indicate the number of the symptoms that this patient's experiencing. So we really start to see a lot more diversification. So we can use them in a whole bunch of places. How well are they tolerated? Depends. Um, early on for most of the antidepressants, um, patients tend to have quite a few adverse effects. Gastrointestinal distress tends to be one of the most frequent. So diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, um, those can be reported in well over 20% of patients. Um, patients do tend to develop a tolerance to them, but not always. Um, so that is something we want to be mindful of. Do they need to take it with food? Potentially, if they take it at bedtime, might they be able to sleep through some of those effects? But something that we um, that may cause discontinuation early on. So we need to prepare patients that they may experience that and see if they can get through it. Um, if they're pretty depressed and then this makes them feel worse, um, it really shouldn't be a surprise that we see so many patients abandon their prescriptions before they've gotten two or three months in. A number of these medications can um, cause some sleep disturbances. So both insomnia as well as somnolence um, have been reported, so it may go in either direction. I think SSRIs are a great example of that. Some of the patients, it makes them super sleepy, and other patients, it, it makes them a little bit more wired or agitated, and they can't get to sleep at all. Dry mouth and headache also tend to be um, reported more than 5% of the time initially, but tolerance does develop. The weight changes, um, with the exception of bupropion, most of the other medications have been reported, um, and bupropion has had some reports of weight gain, but um, SSRIs, SNRIs, TCAs are much more likely to cause mirtazapine to cause some weight gain. Um, this may not happen until patients have been on the medication for a little bit longer, and it may be enough um, that it becomes disturbing. So numerically, it may only be three to seven pounds, maybe 10 pounds, depending on the class of medication we're talking about and the dose that's being used. But that may be enough where the patient's clothes don't fit anymore, or they really start to feel uncomfortable and they notice that weight gain. Um, so that would be one thing we'll want to keep in mind long term. Other potential adverse effects that tend to be problematic are things we should take into consideration. And again, this is by no means inclusive. Um, for our serotonergic agent, so that big long list, sexual dysfunction is incredibly common. Um, so I've seen reports that up to two thirds of patients that are on antidepressants with serotonergic tendencies have some form of sex sexual dysfunction. Um, so it could be just loss of any type of um, sex drive whatsoever. It may be issues with arousal or issues with orgasm. These are not adverse effects um, unless the patient has a really good relationship with you that they're likely to disclose readily. So it is something that we should be asking about and screening for. This tends to be one of the main reasons why patients on maintenance antidepressants will stop them um, is because this does tend to impact their quality of life. Other considerations, um, especially some of our serotonergic agents, they can increase the risk of bleeding um, there are reports of patients with a greater incidence of upper GI bleeds. 
um, if they're on the antidepressants. And this um, happens even more frequently if patients are routinely taking things like um, ibuprofen or aspirin that's over the counter, or if they're on other anticoagulants. Um, so if they do have to be on a blood thinner for any other reason. So that also might be a reason why we'd wanna steer them away from some of these agents. If they have to be on both, we just need to monitor a little bit more closely. Briefly, just to look at some of the other side effects, because this definitely is a differentiator. Um, I was at a CE presentation when I was in pharmacy school, and um, the person put up like a Jeopardy board, and it had all of these side effects listed in the different um, squares. And they asked, okay, go ahead and pick two. Um, two of those that you absolutely would not want. Um, and his point was the adverse, um, I think there were, I don't know, like 24 of them, um, all of those adverse effects can be caused by antidepressant medications. By picking out the ones that the patient doesn't want the most, then you kind of have a starting point for, okay, you're going to get side effects, but if you don't want these, how can we work around that? So some of the other unique ones um, for antidepressants, um, we can see hyperhidrosis and um, elevated blood pressure, mainly with venlafaxine in the SNRI class, and that is dose-related. Um, bupropion doesn't tend to work for anxiety, but it can cause some degree of agitation. Um, so for, if a patient is agitated or anxious, um, that might not be the best agent for that particular um, patient, but it does cause weight loss. It has a risk for reduced seizure threshold. I put this on here not because it's common, um, because I wanted it to trigger um, me to remember. So this has a specific warning because patients with eating disorders um, may potentially be at a higher risk for developing seizures if they're on um, bupropion. But all of the antidepressants do lower the seizure threshold. Not usually enough to cause seizures in most patients unless they have other risk factors. Um, but something that is a little bit unique for that one. Mirtazapine can cause sedation and weight gain, but it's inversely do dose related. Um, so we'll see much more of that at lower doses than at higher doses. But unfortunately we see it at lower doses, so it's hard to titrate up. And then things like um, orthostatic hypotension where you get dizzy if you stand up too quickly in sedation, um, with nefazidone and trazodone. The other unique things with that class, the hepatotoxicity, so the liver toxicity, really has limited nefazidone's use um, and the risk of priapism um, is a potential concern with trazodone, despite the fact that we use it relatively robustly, not usually for depression, um, but at lower doses for sleep disorders. The last group um, are the tricyclics. Um, I put this on here, so yes, it does have quite a bit of a side effect burden, um, but the overdose potential was really what the, um, one of the main concerns was um, because the sodium channel blockade can cause cardiac arrhythmias. If patients had a significant quantity and they took it all at one time, that could potentially be relatively lethal. And that was a huge advantage for the SSRIs. Um, but I think we've discounted this group of medications completely. Um, and this is just kind of a, a reminder that, yeah, the side effects are there. Um, but if patients have other comorbid conditions, and this might be a good fit for them, um, it wouldn't be a class that we want to completely forget about. I know I'm getting close to time, so I'm, I'm working on it. And this was my scaled back version too. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the black box warning, so all of the antidepressants carry this. It isn't a differentiator, but for completeness, I wanted to make sure it was included. Um, so suicidal thoughts and behavior, not necessarily attempts in young adults up to 24. And one of the other major considerations in comparing the classes of antidepressants is related to drug interactions. So we have two classes um, that really are much more pronounced in their drug interactions. So our SSRIs, um, again, not all of them are, are um, significant inhibitors, but most of them, fluoxetine, peroxetine, um, sertraline has some inhibitory activity. So they're gonna make higher concentrations of other medications. So if we're adding this on board to a patient that has a number of other medications, it is helpful to make sure we have an updated list so we can watch for that and potentially prevent some toxicity. And then MAOIs. So this would be the one class where we're really trying to avoid use with other antidepressants because of the risks of having too much dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin on board.
And it also, I know it's not a drug interaction, um, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, the tyramine content of the diet um, has to be maintained for most of the MAOIs. So legulines are exception um, because it's a little more MAOB specific, but at higher doses, we do need to have patients um, limit the amount of um, smoked foods, red wine, beers, um, things like that. So they have to be a little bit more mindful to make sure that they don't develop um, significantly elevated hypertension that could be a medical emergency. So just to wrap up, um, our antidepressants are mainly targeting uh, neurotransmitters of serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. There's definitely differences between what they do. Um, so it gives you quite a bit of flexibility and quite a few options to be able to use with your patients. And we're looking at new targets um, as evidenced by some of our newer agents, um, focusing a little bit more on glutamate and GABA. But patient response really is individualized. Um, so just because they didn't respond to one SNRI doesn't mean that they won't respond to another. And tolerability definitely has limited the utilization of um, agents like the tricyclic antidepressants. Um, most of the other agents tend to be well tolerated, but it doesn't mean that side effects aren't still problematic. So checking in with your patients to see how well they're able to manage um, and tolerate their medications is important.